and a very warm welcome to you this evening. Regular viewers of this channel will know that earlier in the week we pulled a ultra rare rainbow Pokemon card. Now that card pull came in the introduction to one of my third year student sessions exploring the rise of Italian fascism. To commemorate the fact that my third year students have bestowed great fortune upon me whilst pulling Pokemon cards, I have made a verbal commitment corroborated on this video channel to perform for them. Now, the weather is terrible and lockdown is gradually closing in all around us, so I was struggling to think what could I do as a performance piece for the amusement and entertainment of my third year fascism students. Well, it just so happens that during this week, I managed to lay my hands on a first edition English language translation of the Cardinal's Mistress. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Cardinal's Mistress, you will now know that this is the romance novel penned by Benito Mussolini. Think of this as a book before bedtime. Not a good book. This is not good. But it is a book. And so I thought, on this occasion, I would deliver, for your entertainment, a dramatic reading of the opening chapter of The Cardinal's Mistress. Now, this really takes us back to uh, the early part of Mussolini's evolution as a, as a literary contributor. Of course, we know Mussolini very well for his work as a journalist. And of course, he flips and flops with his personal politics and the newspapers that he is affiliated with. But in the midst of his penmanship on political uh, contributions through his own papers as much as anything else, he also put pen to paper on this. Now, I do stress it's not a great work of literature, but it does provide some interesting insights into the mindset of Mussolini, his attitudes towards women, his attitudes towards male role models, much of his own personal character, and parts of his own personal story come through in this text. If you are so motivated, I can do another... 12 weeks worth of videos. We can do the entire book if you want. I suspect you won't. But we'll see. So, if you are comfortable, perhaps you are pulling the covers around you, you have a warm beverage at your hand, perhaps even a glass of gin, a slice of cake perhaps, or a well-chosen Italian batchy chocolate. They are quite delicious. Make yourself comfortable as we continue our journey through Italian fascism with The Cardinal's Mistress by Benito Mussolini. Enjoy. From the tiny churches hidden within the newly budding verdure of the valleys, the even song of the Ave Maria floated gently forth and died upon the lake. The riven peaks of the mountains gleamed in the last reflections of the setting sun, and already the first shades of night descending peacefully upon the forests and the solitary abodes of men, impelled wayfarers to hasten their belated steps on the Gudicari road. The caress of an invisible hand curled the wavelets of the lake, which, with a weary murmur, licked the foliage of the ancient willows, forever casting their tresses upon the water. On the shore, a file of cypresses notched the horizon, and deep in the heavens quivered the stars. In the air, there was the indefinable and penetrating exultation of May, and through all trembled the echoes of the eternal song which the spring sings every year to life, to the universal life, which can never die. Carl Emmanuel Medruso, Cardinal and Archbishop of Trent, and secular prince of the Trentino, had abandoned the oars of the little bark and seemed enchanted with the suavity of the hour. Facing him was Claudia. For a while, the two lovers said no word to one another. The cardinal wore on his head an exquisite cap of black silk, 
and over his shoulders an ample garment of velvet upon which gleamed the silver clasps of his belt. A month of sojourn in the castle had not benefited the health of the prince. He had not been able to rest as he had intended. Too many cares tormented him. His soul was shaken by too many tempests. The wrinkles of his brow had become deeper. The nose, crooked in the middle, had become sharper. His large and widely opened eyes wore a look of melancholy, while his hair, falling in thinning locks over his temples, his whole figure was stooped not from age, but beneath the weight of an ancient, burning sorrow. Claudia was leaning slightly over one side of the bark and had immersed her hand in the water to enjoy its freshness. Beneath her silken robe was visible the provocative outline of her body, and her white face gleamed beneath her black tresses. Her half-closed eyes understood the sorcery of poisonous passions. The next day the Cardinal would be obliged to return to Trent, and this was the last excursion which the two lovers would make together. The immenseness of the parting saddened them. Their spirits were invaded by presentments of woe. In the future, perhaps, would come the fulfilment of some obscure menace. Emmanuel raised his head, met the gaze of Claudia, and decided to speak. The bark rode motionless in the midst of the lake, beneath the shades of night. The castle, with its few lighted windows, could scarcely be distinguished. Tomorrow I shall return to Trent, said the cardinal with a slight tremble of the voice. You will remain here. Claudia made a quick gesture of surprise. Huh. But Emmanuel continued. It is necessary. Tomorrow Donna Maria of Spain will depart. Was the departure not fixed for the end of June? asked Claudia. And that is true, but certain events have precipitated matters. This afternoon, Don Benizio came to me to tell me of the unexpected decision. Tomorrow, I dare not fail to do the honours in the noble fashion which the tradition of my race requires. And, having pronounced those words, Emmanuel returned in imagination to a time five months before, when Anna Maria arrived in Trent. It was but a few days before Christmas of the year 1648 that the advance guard of the princely cortege touched Italian soil a little beyond San Michel. Almeria, daughter of the Emperor Ferdinand III, King of Austria, journeyed, accompanied by her brother Ferdinand, King of Hungary and Bohemia, by Cardinal Denelia, Archbishop of Prague, of Prince d'Arspeng, uh, by the Duke of Terranova, by the Magrave of Bada, and by many other princes, cavaliers, and ladies, and was bound for Spain, where she was wed, where she was to wed Philip the Fourth. Emmanuel Madruzzo, Bishop of Trent, went out to meet her with a suit of five hundred gentlemen, splendidly attired in rich and bizarre liveries, and a guardolo, where the two magnificent processions met. Emmanuel kissed the hand of the future Queen of Spain and offered her hospitality in the castle of Barnard Clesio, which the first Madruzzi had transformed into a residence worthy of a papal or imperial court. In the clear and cool morning air of December, the trumpets of the horsemen and the songs of the pages summoned the peasants to the boulevard of Gardolo. They uncovered their heads with gestures of profound humility at the passing of the coach in which the young princes sat dreaming of future honours and grandeur and tasting in advance the joy of the impending nuptials. The people of the Trentino received the future Queen of Spain with high festival. At the first appearance of the procession, Rarenga, the historical bell of patiently chiselled bronze began to resound continuously in the high tower of the fortification. The bells of the other towers responded, and in the serene sky, serene as only an Italian sky can be, 
and into all the valley there penetrated the long reverberations of the knelling until it seemed they might call to life the echoes sleeping beneath the wintry mist of the mountains and wake the souls of the dead. The artillery of the castle boomed in recurrent volleys. In short, the entire population of Trent was in the streets. The merchants closed their shops, the artisans their workshops, the professional men their studios. The houses were empty, the women and children appeared in the doorways. Eager questions scurried from mouth to mouth, and every reply was accompanied and listened to with loud cries of admiration. And, as though by a tacit sign of understanding, the crowd surged towards the German section and the San Martino quarter, and took its place on either side of the road in which, far in the distance, the iron beat to the horses' hooves, the dazzling glitter of caresses, the flash of helmets and picks and halberds, and the crackling of artibuskin volleys announced the sovereign guest. At the gaze of the city, the procession stopped to organise its triumphal pomp. Eight horsemen, clad in white, rode ahead. They wore no caresses and carried no arms. On each breast was a huge red cross. Not far behind followed the soldiers of the escort. The coach of Anna Maria, drawn by four richly caparisoned horses, was surrounded by ladies of the suit, by high dignitaries of the court, by the nobility and clergy of Bohemia, Hungary and the Trentino. Following, after the compact group which contained de decedents of our... Uh, Oh, my apologies, descendants of all the noblest races of Europe, from the furrowed lands of the Danube to the sea-washed plains of Mangalzani, from the limitless steppes of Hungary to the green hills of Bohemia, from the snowy peaks to the fertile plains of Eredano, rode an immense troop of horsemen, superb in their burnished steel armour. They were the veterans of the last war, which had just been ended with the universal peace of Munster, Soldiers of all tongues, the heroes of many a cavalry charge, now reduced to purely decorative functions, since the romantic and ideal meaning which once had been ascribed to them had vanished under the diabolical irony of Cervantes the poet. The procession ended with a long file of baggage trains, and behind pressed the people who had watched the parade with admiring eyes. The cries of the crowd, who as always, forgot their daily misery in this vision of splendour, were from time to time drowned by the notes of a horn into which a giant horseman from Bohemia was blowing with all the strength of his lungs. Emmanuel Medruso now recalled every particular of this ceremony. He recalled the gaiety of the Tentine people, the address of the chamberlains, the brief phrases of Anna Maria, the ceremony in the cathedral, the evening illumination of the city. Anna had been much moved by the splendour of her reception. Then came long winter weeks, which were wild away in entertainments, hunts and banquets, not inferior to those of Lucellus. Three months into the entrance of Anna Maria, in Trent, no fewer than five princes were lodged in the castle. The Queen Bride, the King of Hungary, the Archduke Ferdinand Karl, with the Archduchess, his consort, the Archduke Francis Sigismund, the Bishop of Augusta, and the Duke of Mantua. Few courts in Europe could at the time rival the House of Madruso. Emmanuel, the last, had the mercenism and the prodigality of the lords who governed the Italian cities in the dawn of the Renaissance. He squandered his wealth, since uh, in him his race would be extinguished, and the principate left without an heir. Of what use to save money in anticipation of a future which would never be? Better to live without worrying, rejoice, and forget. Then, for twenty years, the passion of love had seized him with such volume that he cursed the principate and despised the purple of the cardinalate. He loved Claudia. The relation was universally known, and for the most part condemned and regarded as a serious sin. 
The spirit of Emmanuel Medruso naturally inclined to sentiments of virtue inherited from his maternal ancestors had long been the theatre of a struggle between two opposing sentiments, the juices of the brinkbait and the dignity of the purple on the one hand and on the other, his love for Claudia. Between them, he was lashed into one of those tragic passions which wreck men's lives. During the spring, in which the court of Trent entertained the most illustrious and powerful personages of Europe, the life of the castle and of Trent was intense and tumultuous. Emmanuel sought to numb himself in the hope of calming the inner struggle which was tearing him to pieces. He failed. By the end of April, he had obliged Claudia to leave. He feared for her life, since it was threatened by conspiracy which, it was said, had been formed among the ecclesiastics hostile to the house of Madruzzo. She had retired to Castle Tublino, guarded and defended by a group of ruffians in which Emmanuel placed the utmost confidence. But within a few days, Emmanuel himself had joined her at Castle Tublino. The afternoon following the conversation between Claudia and her prince, Anna Maria of Spain, left Trent. Emmanuel had wished to give her to the departure, as to the arrival, a character of solemnity. While the long procession wandered in way through the Burgo Novo in the direction of Verona, the bells rang in unison and the artillery fired salutes from the castle. But the people who in December had fallen over one another to acclaim the royal guest were now absent. The sojour of Anna had emptied the coffers of the Principate and had obliged the cardinal to impose new and odious taxes which bore upon all classes of society. The quarrels between the Trentini and the Spaniards of the Queen's suit were frequent and brought discord and mourning to many families. The discontent, augmented by more remote causes, became evident. The councillors of the prince, among whose Claudia's father, uh, Ludovico Particelli, were predominant, feared an outburst of popular wrath. At the time of the great council, the poor of the town had been confined in the quarter below the castle, in order that the sight of their wretchedness might not disturb the digestions of the 216 bishops, the 22 archbishops, the five legates, two cardinals, three patricians, and the innumerable band of minor priests who discussed Catholic theology in Santa Maria Maggiore. But now misery knocked at all doors and forced the sick men, women and children to go begging in the valleys. It was therefore with a sight of relief that the city watched the Queen depart. Emmanuel Medruso accompanied her as far as Materello. Here, amid great commotion on the part of the personages of the suit, the final farewells were said. Anna after a brief sojourn at Roveto, would continue her journey to Madrid, where Philip IV was waiting to lead her to the altar. And that concludes chapter one of The Cardinal's Mistress. If you would like to hear more of the adventures of Cardinal Madruzzo and his beautiful lover, Claudia, let us know in the comments below. Uh, we probably won't do any more chapters unless we get more Rainbow Rare cards. Um, so, keep your fingers crossed. Either four more cards or less cards, depending on how much you enjoyed the penmanship of Benito Mussolini. Sweet dreams. Good night. <laughs>